bitch under the weather for the past few days. But don't worry, I'm okay. It's nothing serious. But I'm not letting anything stop movie math. Especially because, as they say, hot drinks really help when you don't feel well. Like tea? And we have so much drama to discuss. There's so much going on. Oh, boy. So hello and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where it is true, Nintendo does print money. And now, Hollywood knows. Cut back to just a few weeks ago at the Super Mario Brothers premiere where I saw this funny meme floating around about how Miyamoto, a key player at Nintendo and the creator of their top brands, including Super Mario Brothers, is totally ignored on the press line. They had no idea who he was, but now, again, Hollywood knows. Uh, and Hollywood is a pretty, a pretty seductive place. Once you're on their radar, they're like, hey, how you doing? They've got glitz, glamour, and glitterati. Can Miyamoto and the rest of Nintendo overall stay on top of their other stuff and resist temptation? Or will they be like, oh, well now we're, we're Hollywood hotshots. Hi, everybody, move over. Oh, no, they ruined our brand, spit us out. I mean, can you really ruin Nintendo? But I mean... You guys, video game fans know, it's been rough in Hollywood. It's been rough. So Nintendo, their 2022 revenue, isn't it fun learning about a new industry? So their 2022 revenue was around 13 billion with a B. Uh, I mean, they're like way past the billion dollar club. Uh, and, that, and that's just one company. Whereas all of Hollywood in 2022 pulled in 26 billion worldwide. That's all the studios. Every, and that's not just American movies, all the movies. So at Hollywood's peak, their best year was 2019, right before the pandemic. Oh, the pandemic drank Hollywood's milkshake. And they were at 42.5 billion. That's incredible. Although Super Mario is doing so well, Hollywood feels it might be able to break 30 this year, but we'll see. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, but fascinatingly, Nintendo, their recent biggest year was during the pandemic when everyone was stuck inside. Time to play some video games, even more so. Uh, they did 16 billion in 2021. But their biggest years to date are 2008 to 2009 back to back with about 17 to 19 billion. Billion! For perspective, uh, back then, that was when the MCU was just getting started. It was a glimmer. In, well, it was actually, you know, uh, Feige had actually produced a film. But, you know, it was early days. Nobody knew it was going to be a cinematic universe. And people thought no one was going to build a cinematic universe. But little do they know, he would lose interest after just one primo movie. <laughs> he was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. That's the problem. Creative people, creatives want to create. You're seeing that with Gunn in D.C. They're not the ideal people to be the suit that's supposed to run the studio. Kevin Feige has his dream job. Whereas I think James Gunn's dream job is to direct a big DC movie, you know, and I think running DC is exciting because it gives him, you know, he gets to pick what he wants to direct and write. But that's still, I think, his ideal situation. And maybe it is. But, you know, I think a suit is still the best person to run uh, a, a, a brand, or in this case, a mini studio. Uh, because James Gunn, by the way, you know, side note, uh, James Gunn did confirm that DC is now operating outside of Warner Brothers Films' purview, and it is its own division, its own division, uh, just like Marvel, uh, over at uh, Warner Brothers uh, Discovery, the major company. We'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. Uh, because the person who runs it, it's not always at his desk. Not always at his desk. And when he's at his desk, he's often writing a screenplay. All right, so, <clears throat> and get this, Nintendo isn't even the biggest video game company. You better watch your back, comic books. You've had a problem, you messed up a little bit, people are getting a little bored, or, you know, there's other stuff at play, and here come video games to drink your milkshake. So, Nintendo isn't even the biggest video game company. Now, of course, it varies depending on what games are released each year, and video game companies don't churn out content at the, at the rate that movie studios do. They're even slower these days. You see video games these days delayed all the time. They're like, maybe next year. And I have to say, video game fans are quite loyal. You guys, for the most part, will wait. Uh, I mean, look how much we got upset in the movie space, and we had to wait one to two years. <laughs> you guys are like, amateurs. All right, so in 2022, Nintendo was fourth, right? Uh, behind Sony, Microsoft, and China's Tencent. But hey, look, Halo totally fizzled on Paramount+, Plus, so it doesn't always work. And this is another case where fans would tell you that Halo failed 
because that wasn't Halo. Uh, it was Hollywood's take on Halo. And in fact, none of the Halo creatives worked on that show. Uh, that's in stark contrast to recent mega hits, you know, comparatively speaking, The Last of Us and Super Mario Brothers. And now that Hollywood sees how much money they can make by getting out of the way, uh, you know, I think they're gonna be like, hey, come over here so we can get out of the way. But, uh, you know, will they really totally, can they always get out of the way? Let's see how much self-control Hollywood has and how much, you know, uh, video games are willing to stick to their guns. Now, again, uh, how do video games, so how do video game companies make sure they have a healthy, mutual, beneficial relationship with Hollywood rather than getting sucked dry? As we said, as we just mentioned, it's been a horrible relationship between video games and movies for decades. And, you know, Hollywood has long said, oh, well, video games are interactive, so it's impossible to, to you know, it just can't be adapted. It's a different kind of experience. But uh, clearly there's not. I mean, because, you know, the Super Mario, although it was weird reviewing Super Mario Brothers, as you know, different criteria seems to be in play uh, with authenticity and recreating the game experience being the most important factors for video game fans when it comes to these uh, things. Although many of you pointed out The Last of Us is unique and that its story is more uh, lauded and of interest than the actual gameplay. Uh, all right, so, and while I already said how Hollywood uh, is, is a temptation to video game creators, let's take a look, uh, well, the latest look at what is making video games so tempting to Hollywood. It's money. It's money. Super Mario Brothers, third weekend at number one. Third weekend. Both weekends miraculously dropping under 40%. Did they both just drop 37%? The, the, this weekend's number isn't final yet, but that would be incredible if they did. Uh, they're like cufflinks on Bowser, man. Uh, sure, partially that's because none of the other studios saw this coming. They were like, because you know, I think they felt it would perform like all the other video game movies. At best, it would do Sonic numbers. But oh my god! So they let Super Mario Brothers be unchallenged at the box office for multiple weekends. One more weekend to go, in fact. They gave Super Mario Brothers the entire month of April. How many movies get that kind of an opportunity? None of them do. None. Not even Disney movies get that. And that just shows you that Hollywood never saw this coming. Uh, and now the movie is almost at 900 million and it hasn't even hit Japan yet, home of Nintendo. As we discussed last Sunday though, even for mega hits, the most Japan's box office has been able to deliver for Hollywood in the past, it's been about 200 million. Smaller country, different kind of culture in terms of going to the movies, you know, that's just the bandwidth that's there. Although, although, uh, homegrown films in Japan have done a little less than double that. So, pie in the hot, pie in the sky projections, Super Mario Brothers could maybe do a little more, three to four hundred. Heck, let's even say maybe it could do five hundred million in Japan. That seems like a lot. But maybe it could. Maybe it could. This movie's breaking all the rules, man. I would never underestimate it at this point. So while I, I don't think Super Mario Brothers is going to get to two billion, especially with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 around the corner, so to speak, you know, two weekends out, I do think it has a genuine shot at cracking the all-time top 10 list worldwide. Domestic, it would need to pass 653 to make that, to make that list, to make the top 10. Uh, and it has about more than 200 million to go to do that. Maybe, maybe it could do it, right? So there is a nice headline going around, by the way, that a lot of people are uh, excited about, especially because some of you are in your anti-Disney era. And that's that uh, Super Mario Brothers is now the fifth highest grossing animated movie of all time. But slow your roll, man, that's domestic. That's not worldwide. It's way down at number 17 so far on the worldwide chart. Of the 16 ahead of it, for just animated movies, of the 16 ahead of it, eight are Disney Pixar, five are Illumination. So I, maybe that's one of the reasons Nintendo is like, we choose you, uh, you know, for like Pokemon. Uh, and then, uh, although, Ironically, Illumination didn't get Pokemon. Uh, but anyway, two are Blue Sky, which is now actually owned by Disney. And then one is DreamWorks. They are still on there, although Shrek 2. So good. Uh, but I do, I, I do think again, I do. I said it just earlier in this episode. I do think the Super Mario Brothers could ultimately end up being at the top of this list from 17 to number one, right? Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Frozen 2, by the way, got 122 apiece. Pretty much the same amount from Japan and China. Although, while well, Super Mario Brothers hasn't done very well in China, actually, interestingly enough, why do you think that is? Why do you think Super Mario Brothers didn't do well in China? Although, we of course know, if you know your history, China and Japan hate each other's guts. But anyway, uh, Super Mario Brothers might rally in its home court. And again, could do way, blow way past 122 uh, to, to make up for the loss uh, in, in China. 
As for the rest of the box office, horror continues to be a real bright spot for theatrical, super cheap movies that people are willing to see in theaters. With a great cinema score for a horror movie, usually they're in the C range, and a strong audience score on RT, Evil Dead Rise is a real win for Warner Brothers, debuting right in line with similar horror movies from the other studios as of late. Sure, it's a touch shy of the last Evil Dead, like a decade ago, so not even accounting for inflation, but a win is a win, especially for Warner Brothers Discovery, which is badly in need of one. Although Warner Brothers Discovery hasn't even really gotten started yet for the year, despite being four months into it. They still have The Flash, Barbie, Dune Part 2, Wonka, and Aquaman still to go. Let's see if all those movies get released this year. Why not? Why not? You know, especially the DC ones. Let's, let's, let's get this over with. Hopefully they're good. Hopefully they're good. Speaking of major players, Alyssa Sutherland, who saw my review. I was thrilled and honored that she reached out to me on Twitter. That was so cool. As I said, that's one of the reasons that Twitter is still an awesome place. Uh, she's definitely gaining momentum. She's been real, she really worked hard this weekend. She was showing up at a lot of theaters, particularly in the Los Angeles area, doing a lot of interviews, really pushing the movie. This might be her breakout role indeed. I said it should be, but it might actually be. A lot of times what should happen does not happen. Then, just like with Super Mario Brothers, Latino audiences were the top demographic. It is almost always Caucasian audiences which, which are the top demographic. And then for a couple of pictures the last few years, we've seen black audiences be the top demographic. But now, twice in a row, Latino audiences have been what have powered these movies to their, uh, you know, their, their fantastic debuts and performances. Uh, the audience uh, also skewed young, but not too young, not too young. Wonder Brothers Discovery has managed to turn Evil Dead Rise into a real event, challenging even casuals to see if they can make it through the gory and disgusting picture. Even I went! That's how hot this thing was. It had an amazing trailer and everyone was like, that looks cool. Evil Dead Rise could do quite well the next weekend. Uh, in addition, you know, it has one more weekend too before uh, Guardians of the Galaxy hits uh, with no big uh, movies opening the final uh, weekend of April. So I, I think it could have a strong hold. Let's see. Uh, but next weekend, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, a week before it, it releases, is still hoping to be the center of the conversation. Why? Well, let's discuss. This is a very interesting situation. So sensing that Quantumania has done real damage to the brand, both in terms of quality of the film and the unfortunate situation with Jonathan Majors, which is still in a holding pattern before his uh, early May court date, uh, Disney Marvel are handling the debut of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 differently. No big premiere at the El Capitan. Instead, the movie was shown to French press. All the first reactions were in French uh, at the European Gala event this weekend. Then, all critics uh, in North America, uh, at least, uh, and I probably suspect most other countries, will see the movie Thursday night. With the, and so social media embargo is already lifted, but the review embargo lifts the very next day at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday. So Thursday night, all the critic screenings, Friday morning or Friday at 1 p.m., the review embargo drops. But Disney Marvel ain't taking no chances with that RT score. They got hit hard by Quantum Mania, as you might recall. So did Super Mario Brothers. They got hit hard by the, uh, the RT score. I still maintain that Universal knew that was going to be low, which is why the review embargo lifted just the day before release for that movie. That, that's like, you know, you know what that strategy means. So anyway, to, uh, what Disney Marvel is doing is they have fan IMAX screenings that were just announced on Friday night. Sorry if you don't have passes, they're already gone. So I hope, you know, for those of you who have passes, are you excited? They have a handful of uh, fan IMAX screenings on Friday night to either back up the uh, critics' positive RT score that, breaks, that debuts earlier in the day or to combat it. Or there are other combinations that we could see. What do you think is going to happen on Friday? Again, Thursday night, majority of critics see it. Uh, 1 p.m. Friday, the review embargo lifts. Friday evening, fan uh, IMAX screenings, which we should have a ton of conversation online. But that also means spoilers. Ah, oh, man. So uh, you should maybe start muting certain words right now. I mean, I don't know if you can mute all the words. I mean, let's see. I don't know how spoilery of a movie this is. I think it's more of like, do you enjoy the experience? So maybe I think the very fact that they're willing to air it, uh, to show it a week early, Two fans, I think, you know, they just want to get across what a good time it is. So let's see, let's see, let's see. 
But, you know, if you think that's early, a week early for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, well, get ready, because The Flash will be screened for thousands of people at CinemaCon on Tuesday. Tons of people who are not only, uh, you know, in the movie theater business, which is what CinemaCon is, but a ton of press will be in attendance as well. And other people, it's a convention. It's a convention. Remember Top Gun Maverick screened there last year? You remember how many people saw that? Well, that many people are going to be seeing The Flash on Tuesday. And there's also rumor that they're having an L.A. screening as well for a couple of uh, press and fan sites who are in Los Angeles. Uh, and the new trailer, by the way, will drop on Tuesday. So Tuesday is The Flash Day. But woo! Two weeks in advance, man, and we know that The Flash has lots of surprises. And so I think that uh, they're not, it's not going to have any by the time that it hits theaters. So I also hope it's a fantastic just movie-going experience. Uh, then, uh, back to the weekend box office. While Guy Ritchie is a long way from Aladdin numbers to the point that they seem like an anomaly, the cinema score and RT audience score, they're an anomaly for Guy Ritchie. People actually like this movie. What? <laughs> I'm as surprised as you are. I suspect the military theming is connecting to moderate and conservative moviegoers. Again, flexing some muscle at the box office. Uh, but these audience scores are so good, I see a future for The Covenant on digital slash streaming. MGM, now owned by Amazon, right? Which means this movie will go to Prime Video, which has been doing very well with the militaristic sort of content. So this plays right into the audience that they're building. Also, side note, Side note, Homelander has a small role. He has a small role in the Covenant, and you have to wonder if Amazon is trying to build him out as a, you know, a talent beyond the boys by putting him, uh, or having them put him in this film. Maybe they should have put him in the advertising, and it would have done even better, but I guess his role is really small. Uh, then very little money left on the table after the top three spots. Whew, John Wick 4, Air, and Dungeons and Dragons are all pretty much done. Uh, with the latter, not even able to pass the century mark domestic for a big fantasy movie. Oh, yikes, big yikes. And the trades compared it to Power Rangers today. Power Rangers, Power Rangers. Oh my God, I hope Chris Pine invested his $12 million that he got paid for the movie, his biggest payday yet, and probably the last payday he'll ever get of that size. The Pope's exorcist in Renfield, well, they were no match for Evil Dead Rise. Remember last weekend we were like, oh, I hope those movies don't hurt Evil Dead Rise. Evil Dead Rise obliterated them. Both of them fell over 60% in their second weekend. Everyone in that movie will have trouble getting work ever again, certainly in a big movie where they're a lead, unless they've already signed on for it, unless they've already signed on. And then I'm sure the producers are like, how do we get out of this? Aquafina. I feel particularly bad for her. She had a real moment there, and I think she might have missed it. Because, you know, they have the female Asian comedy Joyride, uh, Joyride also debuting at CinemaCon, by the way. Uh, and that has a whole new slate of talent. And, you know, that's a movie Aquafina maybe should have been in. So uh, that's too bad. Because I really like Aquafina, so that's too bad. And it looks like Ari Aster might have killed his own career with word that Bo is afraid is unwatchable spreading like wildfire. Maybe they shouldn't have done previews a week early. Maybe they shouldn't have done week previews a week early. The movie went wide this weekend, but barely made it into the top 10 with a significantly weaker per theater average than its debut. When Everything Everywhere All at Once went wide, itself a quirky movie, its per theater average was almost double what Bo is afraid is, and it was in more theaters. Uh, a three hour, $35 million Ari Aster movie? Somebody drank their own Kool-Aid, just like Damien Chazelle. Do we have another Babylon? I think we have another Babylon. And I see a couple of people championing this film, but not to the degree that they did Babylon. I think that Margot Robbie's fans worked real hard for that one. So that was nice, but you, 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 not enough of you to give it any money at the box office or even to watch it on digital. All right, so... Uh, over on streaming, on that note, let's start with Nielsen, uh, per usual, towards the end of March, second to last weekend of, uh, week of March. Netflix, once again, has a one-two punch to take out the competition on these charts. This week, it's The Night Agent and Shadow and Bone, season two. Then, with softer numbers elsewhere and the latest season of South Park nearing its end, so there's more episodes for people to log on and watch, HBO Max got pretty high up on the overall chart with another acquired show. How bad do the HBO Max originals do? We never see them on these charts. Never. I mean, they've been debuting less and less of them, but woo, woo, they don't do well. Uh, I'm really curious to see how the Max originals do. Uh, but now you can see... Uh, so, by the way, South Park episodes air on Comedy Central, the new ones, and then they go to HBO Max the next day. But now you can see why Warner Brothers Discovery and Paramount are suing the pants off each other over this lucrative brand. 
because we're in an era where brands mean everything. Uh, Mando is sinking a bit as season three progresses. You know, it was pretty strong out of the gate. We were like, oh, maybe it's not having a problem. But now it's starting to have a bit of a problem, showing audiences losing interest. Uh, we'll, it'll be interesting to see where the season ends on these charts, because this is like, what, only its third week, right? Uh, and, you know, it has a lot more episodes to go. When it hits that really difficult chunk, what was it, like uh, five and six, right? Uh, let's see what people, let's see what the numbers look like there. Uh, and speaking of losing interest, Ted Lasso season three ain't doing much better with audiences also clearly unhappy with the direction of the show. You know, it's interesting. I think Ted Lasso intentionally, or maybe they didn't realize it, but it was neutral politically, right? I think it was a show that everyone could enjoy. So it did so well, it blew up. But then the show has gotten, I think, progressively more liberal. I think maybe as they kind of got a little nervous being like, what kind of show are we, you know? Because I think you saw some... Uh, you know, some, what was it, like some conservative lawmakers embracing it, right? Didn't Mitt Romney dress as Ted Lasso, right? So I think they were like, oh, well, let's make it clear which direction this show leans in, but at the cost of some of their audience, clearly. Although I don't know if anybody's really just totally in love with this new season. Uh, but it will be interesting to see about other shows which have walked that line down the middle, right? Like The Boys, I would say, is another show that's kind of in the middle. Uh, how do they handle themselves going forward? Do they stay in the middle? Do they blink and lean one way or the other? And what does that do to their audience? Uh, and look, Prime Video, by the way, has a show on the originals chart with uh, Daisy Jones and the Six just making it. As usual, uh, the movies list has some pretty sad numbers. Woo! Uh, I know it's movies versus series, but we've seen bigger numbers on here. This is bad. Although no pit Prime Video and placed, it placed. It was formerly just on Peacock for streaming, but more studios are willing to cross the streams in the name of profitability, because it seems that streaming ain't that profitable, at least not for them. So we'll return to the old ways, classic cross distribution deals. Instead of studios hoarding all their talent just for themselves on their own streaming service, which was the plan at the beginning of the streaming wars. And then we're like, none of us are doing well. All right, let's try something else. Let's go back, as I said, to the old ways. On Netflix for just last week, not too much exciting stuff happening with their movie section either. But with series, look at this. Ooh, Beef exploded in its first full, full week on the service, doubling its number from the week before. Although the David Cho incident has also expanded the number of eyeballs on it, and uh, it's not going well. And Marvel might have another scandal on their hands. Not just with Steven Yoon, but this also, because it's not like just Steven Yoon and Jonathan Majors, they took the whole creative team behind Beef and stuck it on Thunderbolt. So you've got the director, you've got the writer, you've got Steven Yoon. Uh, and I think, uh, didn't they also bring somebody else over, I think, behind the scenes as well. Uh, but then on Friday, Steven Yoon, uh, creator Lee Sung Jin, who is writing Thunderbolts now, uh, and Ali Wong all came out and supported Cho, and uh, Twitter Twitter was not happy. So uh, let's see how let's see how that situation develops. That was just on Friday. But hey, Quantum Mania is number one on iTunes after debuting on Tuesday, and Avatar two right behind it after two weeks at number one. So it's not all bad for Disney. They're still in there. They're still in there. As for this coming weekend, right before Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 kicks off the summer movie season, there's that sneak peek and a handful of IMAX screens on Friday, while Finland's version of John Wick opens wide, also from Lionsgate. Wow, really doubling down on that. I mean, I don't know why you would potentially dilute your brand, but let's see how it does. The trailer did look quite good. Uh, and Lionsgate actually has two movies opening with their adaptation of the Judy Bloom classic. This is what you said yes to, Rachel McAdams? Uh, seems weird, but let's see. I don't think anybody's going to see that in theaters, if at all, quite frankly. Uh, and the George Foreman uh, biopic also hits theaters, as well as Polite Society and limited release with Ritu Aria from Umbrella Academy. I love her, but do I love her enough to see that movie? I don't know. In the theaters? I don't, I mean, what do you think? Also, somehow, Return of the Jedi has returned to theaters, but not even like on premium screens or on IMAX or Dolby. It's just playing on regular screens. Why would anybody go see it just on a regular screen? Uh, and then on iTunes, Scream 6 hits digital or uh, for purchase wherever digital movies are sold. Uh, you know, it starts its digital journey. It'll eventually go to rental and then streaming way down the line, uh, along with another DC animated uh, movie. That has like some weird crossover. They're like, oh, RXYB or whatever. And you're like, okay. Uh, all right. 
<laughs> Streaming movies, Peter Pan and Wendy. It's Disney Plus on Friday. So far, only screened for British critics. Disney really leaning in to the, to the Euro critics. Uh, then, as for shows, uh, John Mulaney has a new comedy special on Netflix this Tuesday. He's always a delight. Aquafina, her series returns on Comedy Central. All the more important to her post-Renfield. While on Thursday, big day, big day, Love and Death drops three episodes on HBO Max. I reviewed that late last week. Fantastic show. Sweet Tooth drops its entire second season on uh, Netflix. Uh, although I think maybe might have waited a little bit too long. But Shadow and Bone, we just saw its numbers are not bad. Uh, along with the second half of the final season of Firefly Lane, watch by a surprising amount of people. I actually know someone who started watching Ginny and Georgia, and they love it. And I'm like, what is happening? Should I watch Ginny and Georgia? I got Star Wars Rebels to watch, but it's blowing my mind. So that's the sweet... Oh, oh yeah, and also on Friday, the, the Russo brothers are like, see ya, Netflix. You know, I... It's so crazy. They have Citadel, which is, you know, uh, going to be on Prime Video. Uh, and, you know, the Russo brothers are like, we'd like to do a Batman movie, but, you know, we're not doing a Batman movie. Maybe. I mean, they just try to keep getting, it's like embarrassing. They keep trying to get back into the major franchise game, but no one picks them up. And they keep making really bad content, except for, the, I think, the Extraction movies, which they don't direct anyway. And you're like, just stop, guys. I mean, I think at this point, I think they were a hot commodity after they just got out of the blockbuster game with Marvel. But now they've had so many poorly received films. I, I don't know what's going to be able to bring them back. I, I mean, I would be a little nervous about it, quite frankly. Uh, but they did so well with Marvel with their movies. Ah, I'd really, maybe I'd be like, what do you think that is? What do you think the difference was? All right, what do you think the difference was? Why were they so good? But now they're so bad. All right, so that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you think of all this different stuff that's happening in Tinseltown? And how do you see the future of video games in Hollywood? How do you see it? And how do you wish it would be? Share all those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.